Time to talk Buckeyes here at the Voice of College Football. Welcome in Ohio State fans and college football fans across America. We talk Buckeyes with you each and every Wednesday at 1.30 Eastern Time. Please uh, subscribe to the channel before you get settled. Like the video and uh, let people know that we're here talking Buckeyes. Leave those comments and questions in the live chat. We will get to them. And it's all on this guy. He's the one that showed up. And so Tony has saved the show this week. Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Scoop. Tony, it's always good to see you, but especially this week, it's really good to see you. Yeah, saving the show once again. I am here, Mark. Uh, unlike my cohorts who are off gallivanting around the South and around Europe and whatever, and I am right here in Columbus, Ohio, where I should be because I know Wednesdays or Thursdays or whenever we can do the show, I need to be here. And so I have put <laughs> vacations off for four straight years and I am here. Tony doesn't opt out. He will not opt out of a, a minor mid-tier bowl game. He won't do that. So we, we know what we have here with Tony. So this is the, this is the CFP every week right here. <laughs> it, absolutely. It is. Yes. This is top tier stuff. Even though Tony's got his own podcast to deal with, uh, where can people find that? Yeah, Buckeye Weekly Podcast. You can find that at all of your podcast platforms of choice. And uh, right now, this time of year, but dropping about two episodes a week, sometimes a third if we feel frisky. And so, yeah, check it out. Well, the big news of the week uh, came down, what, about 48 hours ago that uh, quarterback Dylan Rayola out of Arizona, 2024 class Number one rated at his position has decided on Ohio State. Of course, we now have to wait, what, about 17 months to hang on to see whether he actually signs. But, uh, of course, the early indications are all positive. Yeah, so this, is a, this was a decision that wasn't made quickly, even though he is a 2024 and he has not yet played his junior season of high school football. Comes from a serious football family, the Rayolas. Everybody knows them there at Nebraska, but – uh, a decision that is uh, not gone and taken lightly. And, and Ohio State doesn't treat their quarterbacks lightly anyway. And so if the two are coming together like this, it, it's pretty serious. And, you know, it's it's forever until he signs, and it's even longer until he plays. Uh, you look at the – think back to C.J. Stroud didn't throw a pass until his redshirt freshman season. So – think that the first time you may get to see Dylan Rayola throw the ball as a Buckeye is 2025. And uh, to say that, to speak that, and it's like, uh, who, who is even going to be here in 2025, Mark? Who, who knows? But Ohio State will have a quarterback room with at least a likely a redshirt freshman, Dylan Rayola. And I still think, obviously, he will play some, get his four games in in 2024 and go from there. But it's a huge thing to already have your quarterback in 2024 and they, they don't have anybody in 2023 yet, but that's a product. I think a byproduct of everything that has happened beforehand, the, the quarterback room is kind of built up and now you, you're not going to like slow play a Dylan Rayola who wants to come aboard. So you get him now. He's the first commit in 2024. Now you just let him recruit. And if anybody follows him on Twitter, he's been pretty active since he committed and he's, you know, why not be the leader, the Pied Piper that brings everybody in? You see the one of the reasons he came to Ohio State is you look at what the quarterbacks have had to work with, with this offense and these receivers. He can now be responsible, partly responsible for bringing in guys that he wants to play with. And and there are a lot of them out there. And so uh, Ohio State right now, the offense looks to be in, in good shape uh, here now in the present and also again in the future. Quick 61 in the chat. That typically doesn't happen in three minutes. So we appreciate everybody being on time today. We were on time. You're on time. It's a good day. All right. Get uh, some other college football fans on in here. Let people know we're talking Buckeyes. All right. So I don't want to get my NCAA committees and boards of directors confused because there was one board that met the board of directors on name, image, and likeness. And if we can do anything we possibly can to avoid that topic for one week, maybe it seems like we're talking about that constantly and I'm kind of sick of it. But if we have to talk about it, we have to talk about it. We answer all questions and comments, of course, but more in interesting to me, even though it's not nearly as impactful on the sport is uh, what you mentioned to me before we started to record. And that's uh, the, the conversation that's been had. Uh, I saw some uh, 
conversations that ensued about the ACC and their structure and what that could look like. Uh, of course, we know what the, the 14 team Big Ten format looks like. Um, just uh, kind of set us up to, to what those conversations, uh, how they uh, are setting up right now and, and what your thoughts are. Yeah, the NCAA Oversight Committee this week made some recommendations for a couple of rule changes that they, they deem like not controversial in terms of they should should pass then later this month. The first one was the kind of elimination of the rules on how a conference championship game is determined because I think the rule right now is if you have 12 or more teams and you have to have divisions and there are conferences that would kind of like to eliminate divisions and this would be one way to do that. So you, you eliminate the rules on how to have a championship game and now conferences can do it however they want and they that can then eliminate the divisions. The other rule was a, uh, a two-year waiver on the 25 scholarship limit cap like each year and just have a two year where you can sign as many as you need staying under that staying at the 85 but allowing programs to replenish their their players because they've lost some to co you know like the covid changed everything in terms of numbers and now transfer the transfer portal has changed some things so just a two year waiver to let programs build things back up but back to the the division thing i think you know, I saw the same thing that you saw with the with the ACC speculation, where you would have basically uh, every team would be tied to three other teams in terms of that you play those three every other year, and then you would cycle through the other ten teams you know, through a, a period of four years, and it would allow everybody, every player, to play at every venue. Then it would be very easy to see the Big Ten follow suit with that. And and the interesting thing about that, Mark, is it's just eight conference games, and so that still allows you if you wanted to if the Big Ten wants to play an ACC team, a Pac-12 team, or whatever, it allows them to continue to branch out and do that. But, you know, going back to the original leaders and legends, and one of the reasons that Ohio State and Michigan were split up was so that there's a possibility that they could play again in the Big Ten championship game. It never happened, and then quickly they were put in the same division. But now this would put that back into play. And I'm just wondering if you, if the people out there, would you like to see that game two weeks in a row? I, I can guarantee you Ohio State fans would have loved to have seen it last year. Absolutely. And uh, you were headed in the same direction I was in terms of, yes, I, I don't know where the, the, the overall fan base would stand on that because I get feedback from certain people that say this game is sacred. Mm -hmm. It just needs to be played once. To it's it's going to be cheapened by playing it, even though it is under championship conditions. The next week, uh, you're almost negating, in a sense, what happened the week before. And I understand the point. It's it's a situation where there are certain arguments that come up where I'm like, this is the way to do it. This is not. This is logical. That's not logical. But I can see both perspectives here. I think it would be intriguing to see them play two weeks in a row. It would be intriguing to see them play in the Big Ten championship game. It would just be be historic. It would be different. It takes me back to 2006 when there was the possibility of a rematch in the BCS championship game, and I was all for that, uh, despite Ohio State already taking care of business. Um, and it being theoretically, I don't know that this has been substantiated, difficult to beat a a team in college football twice in one season or an NFL team three times in one season. I, I hear that all the time. I've never seen anybody put the metrics to it, but um, I, I'm on the fence. I Now, if we're five to 10 years down the road and they've played in four Big Ten championship games in eight years, I may be reconsidering that and thinking, okay, the shine's worn off the – the uniqueness of this and let's get back to just the game being the game. Yeah. I, I think that is a risk. Although um, I do want to go, I will eventually have to go back and look and see since the start of the big 10 championship game, what would it have looked like with, with no divisions and let's see how many times Michigan is in there. You know, we know they've made one big 10 championship game in, in the divisional setup, how many times would those would Ohio State and Michigan have played with a, a two-team, uh, no, no division set up? I think that would be interesting to find out to see, again, how likely 
will it be? Let's see how often it how, how often it happened in the past, and that would give us an idea. Uh, I don't know that it, it would be also interesting to see how does this affect the teams in the West because the West has, as I've always said, like anybody in the West can win the West, and any and if they're, if they're good that year, they can beat everybody in the West, and there's a good chance they can walk into the Big Ten championship game, eleven and one. 12 and 0, something like that. We've seen Iowa was one win away from playing for national champ or playing for the playoffs. Um, you know, or and Wisconsin has been one win away from playing in, in the playoffs. And so um, will that still be the case if they're not playing mostly just the Big Ten West? And what does this do for them? And I'd be interested to know how Kirk Ferentz feels about it, how you know the coaches out there, Scott Frost. Although you know he may want to play everybody just because he he's wired differently. But what do the West teams think of this? And I, I bet James Franklin is probably all for it. You know, Jim Harbaugh is probably all for it. So no longer have to be. You don't have to leapfrog Ohio State to play in the Big Ten championship game. It is a huge. Uh, it, it's. It, it eliminates one gigantic burden. So I think they would love it. As long as the schedule wasn't weighted, meaning that there wasn't continued preference, and there probably would be because the rivalries tend to be you know, distributed in those two pockets of East and West. You know, you've got to play Minnesota, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Iowa, Wisconsin. There's a concentration of rivalries there. There's a concentration maybe to a lesser extent in the East, but there still is. So those designated opponents may continue to build schedules that continue to give Western division, what are now Western division teams. A, I won't say an advantage, but, a better opportunity to continue to get to the championship game. Yeah, I would agree with that. And we just recorded a podcast talking about this and immediately you think of, well, Ohio state would be tied to Michigan state, Michigan and Penn state. Whereas, you know, like somebody out in you know, Illinois is tied to certainly three teams, not as good as that, or you know, Nebraska will be tied to three teams as good as that. And, and then you have to wonder, well, is that fair to those four teams? And it's probably not that they would be tied together. And Penn State is probably going to have to be tied to some semblance of Maryland and Rutgers. And so it becomes difficult to figure out exactly how to do all of this and who your three teams are every year. And that's where maybe you, you have to break up Ohio State's annual, Michigan State, Michigan, Penn State, something like that. And and bring in a, a Nebraska or a Wisconsin instead of a Penn State or instead of a Michigan State. I don't. I, I just don't know that the Big Ten is going to separate Ohio State and Penn State by any in any type of setup because the TV really likes them. So I'll take it to the SEC where they have a situation where everyone plays within the division, of course, and then they play two. Uh, non-division opponents, and one of those is set. Just like the ACC does the same thing. One of those is a set rival. And in some cases, that rival is legit. Alabama, Tennessee have been playing forever. It's a big deal, so forth and so on. Auburn, Georgia, the South's oldest rivalry, et cetera. But then they fill in the blank on other rivalries just to have a designated team. And I don't know why they do that or why that's necessary. Ole Miss and Vandy, Kentucky, Mississippi State. There's no connection between these. Texas A&M and South Carolina. You can't pick two schools that have less to do with one another than those two. Why do they have to play every year? Um, I, I would hope that the Big Ten would assess each team and say, okay, who are natural rivals to that school? And how can we make this as uniform as possible? But if we don't make it uniform, is that if Ohio State has three and Purdue has three and a number of teams have three, but some only have two and some only have one, is that okay? And can we work through some schedule models to see if that works? Why force hmm. there to be set opponents to some schools that aren't validated by any kind of connection or rivalry yeah and the, the forcing of the rivalry 
has I don't know has has it worked with Penn State and Michigan State with the land grant trophy? You know, Penn State comes in and it's like okay, you and Michigan State, you guys will play the last week every year, or whatever. And it's and that's been what you know thirty years now almost, and it's it's yeah. kind of something, but it's still manufactured. You know, it's been manufactured, and so yeah, it almost feels um, it's certainly not organic. And the thing about college football rivalries is the great ones are organic. And so, yeah, maybe you don't shoehorn stuff in. And I, I think I, why would, why would some programs be against that? Like, Oh no, we want to, we want our three team. We want to know who they are every, every, you know, two years or whatever. And it's like, well, you will know in advance, you know, in plenty of time who the teams are, but I, I don't know why they would get upset about, well, Ohio State has three rivals and, and we only have one. It's like, well, that's because you're Indiana. You have one rival. Like, you, do you do you want more? I don't think you do. You, I think you want to just go ahead and you know, do you want to have a rivalry with Ohio State? Because we can make one if you want one. We we can give you, you know, the the, the I-71 trophy or whatever, the you know, I-70 trophy. And, and now you get to play Ohio State every year. Here you go. Be careful what you ask for. As soon as you brought that up about Michigan State, Penn State, of course, they do play uh, at the conclusion of each season. And then once Maryland and Rutgers joined, they attached them. And, and that seemed to make there's a regional um, proximity, of course, with the two teams. Uh, and then it was as though the, the Big Ten second guessed itself. So at the same time that they added uh, Penn State, Michigan State as a rivalry the last weekend of the season, and then a couple decades later, Nebraska, Iowa, and then a few years later, this Maryland Rutgers, they kind of second guessed themselves for a few years because I knew they took a break from that for a few years. So in 2016, they broke from Michigan State, Penn State, and actually 2017 for three years, they, they broke it up. And they went with Michigan State taking on Maryland. They took on Rutgers, and they had Rutgers. I, maybe they felt as though we're kind of sanctioning off Maryland and Rutgers, and they they just feel like they're kind of a, a, a addendum to the league or something, and they don't they really are. count. So we want to integrate them into these this. So, but then now they've reverted back to Michigan State and Penn State. So it's 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 kind of odd there. But I like that they went unconventional when they reorganized the divisions and they said our only cross division rivalry is Purdue and Indiana. So we're going to play that and we're not going to like make things up. Yeah. I mean, and Ohio state and Illinois used to be tied together. They, they they've got a rivalry. That's the, the only trophy Ohio state plays for in, in big 10 is the, the Illa buck. And it's like, well, that's no longer, don't worry about it. They'll, they'll play again eventually. And uh, it's not something that has to happen. But yeah, it's it's. I think it's okay to, as we're going through all of these changes, you don't have to f make everybody uniform. You can, by when you make everything uniform, that can almost eliminate some of the fairness you're trying to create. When you're just putting people together, well, we've these other these three natural people, these natural rivalries exist. Now we have to create unnatural rivalries, and or you can just alternate who they play you know, every, every, every year. And, and then uh, you, you can eventually, maybe by doing that, something happens that a rivalry is created. Have you figured out the way you would do it? And if you want to save that for an article, you can just give us a quick hint and tease, and then you can point us in that direction. No, Cause the thing is, I, I, I will eventually try to, figure out how I would do it because you immediately think I like the idea of you have three play, three teams you play every year, but for Ohio state, that's automatically Penn state, Michigan and Michigan state. And now you have to think about, but what if it's not? And so which one of those teams do you give up and who do you change it for? Because, you know, I, I don't know that Ohio state needs to play Michigan state every year. You know, I wouldn't mind seeing them play Nebraska, frankly, or Wisconsin every year or something like that. And I don't know that it needs to be three teams, but the math works out well. With you play three teams every year, and then the other five teams in an eight-game schedule, every if a player stays for four years, he will play at every venue in the Big Ten, and he will play every team twice. Whereas in the SEC right now, with the way they do some things, you'll have you know 
entire de a decade without going to a place. So I like the idea of playing at every place within a four year span, especially as somebody who travels to these games and you get to see different places and experience them. So I think that would probably be where I start, but I, I don't think it's a simple process process to just figure out, okay, who plays who and who plays every year. And, and you know, that's what the computer programs are for, but even determining who are your three opponents every year, like if that's they're gonna, who they're going to do it, like that, that gets tricky as well. And you're going to have to make sacrifices, I think. And I think it depends on the age of the person that's that's looking this over because for if you're 20 years old, Ohio State, Michigan State seems like, well, they have to play. Um, it's only been since 2013 that they last did not play a regular season game against each other because they were in opposite divisions. And before 2010, there were no divisions. And it there were certain teams, and, and Tony, you probably remember the schedule format prior to divisions better than I do because I, I don't know that I ever knew how they figured out who was playing who besides, of course, Ohio State and Michigan are playing. And Ohio State and Penn State, they, they always play those two, and I always thought that was unfair to those two schools to have to play each other even though it was a game everyone wanted to see. But Michigan State seemed to be one of those teams that Ohio State saw as infrequently as just about anybody in the conference. There, there seemed to be, you know, two year stretches. They didn't see Michigan State, then they'd play them a few years, and then they wouldn't see them for two years. And and um, there were certain teams like that. Purdue, they there were gaps in there, but the, it didn't seem to be equitable. Yeah, and I'm just trying to think back to. You know, the teams that I saw when I was in school there and teams that I didn't get to see. And yeah, it didn't seem like there was a rhyme or reason other than you, you played most of them because there were only 10, 11 teams at the time. And so it wouldn't be too hard to catch up on the three that you didn't see or, or however many. But I, I think having a uniform system in terms of how often and knowing that you will play every team in a four-year span, I think that's a good way to go, and, and 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 just it allows everybody to benefit from being in that conference. It allows Minnesota to get a home game with Ohio State every four years, to get a home game with Minnesota with Michigan every four years. Or although you know, there's another thing: Michigan and Minnesota have a rivalry. Are they tied together? Like, do you do you take that rivalry away? And, and so. There, there's a lot in there where you have to try to keep all of that going, and it's probably more difficult with a smaller pod than it is with a larger pod, you know? We got uh, Tony Gerdeman here from Buckeye Scoop. I uh, got about 120 on the line. We appreciate you being here. You can see uh, below on the ticker, we've got a Discord. If you want to talk Ohio State football, college football, sign up on Patreon, and please check out Tony Tony's work. He's a... Uh, Certainly a talented writer. So get on over, check out his work at Buckeye Scoop and also his um, podcast that um, is uploaded how often, Tony? Uh, a couple times a week. It's Buckeye Weekly. That's the podcast. During the season and starting of camp, it's about a daily podcast. So it's not the best named podcast. I, I didn't think so. Okay. <laughs> Bu Buckeye whatever, uh, if you want to change the name on me there, Mark. We had a question come in here. We're going to start knocking off these questions as well. And I've lost track of it, but I think I can uh, paraphrase it. Basically, we had Steve Dace from Michigan mm -hmm. Podcast on. He has his team total talent rankings. And if you understand the premise of that, it's not he's not predicting who's going to win how many games, but he's basically saying this is the measurement of the talent. Well, you would think, okay, it's just a reflection of recruiting rankings. Well, he does adjust it if a player proves to be better than his uh, initial ranking. Tanner Morgan throws 30 touchdowns. He's no longer a low three-star. He's a whatever, a mid-four-star. Uh, but he doesn't reduce it for guys that underachieve because they still have that potential to, to achieve that. Okay. I had to tell him he was crazy because I said, I respect your, your, your talent rankings and I love what you're doing here. And I think it's credible, but it's not perfect. And it's certainly not perfect because I don't know how you get that Michigan's more talented than Ohio state. When despite the win last year, I don't think they were more talented last year. They lose two tremendous, even if they weren't five stars 
uh, coming in, you got to up their rating to a five star, I guess, with a job Owen Hutchinson, they're gone and your thousand yard back and Daxton Hill and da 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 da. And I know the Buckeyes lost talent, but, um, it, you know, to adjust the, the ranking and bring in two five stars on defense for Ohio State in this recruiting class, plus I counted eight players just on defense ranked in the top 25 at their positions. I just didn't see how that added up. So there was a question here just to get your thoughts about is Michigan more talented than Ohio State? Yeah, and I, I respect what Steve does because he's done this for years. And the rankings, his, his rankings are what they are. They're not skewed towards Michigan because of, you know, the number of, um, you know, general studies majors or the number of kinesiology majors. You get more points for that. No, it's it's all about, you know, his own uh, system there. And, and I respect it. And so if that's what it says, it's what it says. However, if that's what it says, you might want to think, it, is there some bad data going in here? Is, is there something that needs to be tweaked? Because I'm with you. I don't, I don't know how it can be. Um, you mentioned the losses. Daxton Hill is, is a huge loss for that secondary. I, I think actually Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo is a huge loss for the secondary as well, because they made that secondary very, very good. And now you've lost that. You've lost starting corner. You've lost leading tackler. I don't think the defensive line depth has always been an issue for me for Michigan. And I, you don't replace those two guys you lost and the guys who will be stepping in for them won't be as good. The offensive line will be okay, but I still think they were overrated last year. Not against not against Ohio State. They did just fine there. I think having J.J. McCarthy out this spring was a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing in that it didn't create any controversy and nobody transferred. It's a curse in that you need somebody of J.J. McCarthy's potential to take you to the next level, and he missed a spring. And so now you're going to have a situation this season where – Cade McNamara, if he's not playing well, you're going to want to put J.J. McCarthy in. J.J. McCarthy is still semi – he'll be semi-experienced at that point and won't necessarily always know when not to do something. And we've seen him make mistakes in the past, and you got to learn from them. But you got to be on the field to learn from them. And, and so I don't – I think the receivers are really good. Uh, they've got a lot of them. They've got a lot of decent receivers. I like the running game, the running backs – I just don't see it from the defense and you lose your defensive coordinator as well. And I, I would have to, it was it close with the two rankings. Close? Yes, it was I mean, close. It was within like three points and what a point means. I don't really know, but when it's three Oh eight and three eleven, that seems close to me. Yeah. And you know, I, I do uh, my own thing with the uh, rankings and, and positional rankings in the spring, and then I'll add them up and see, and that's my prediction for like, I'll do positional rankings and then I add them all up after a series of doing these. And that's my predictions on who will be, um, you know, going to the big 10 championship game. And I had you know Indiana and Ohio state, I think really close last year. And it, clearly my stuff was flawed <laughs> and I will admit that, but you know, I just, I, I, you tell me that. And if I'm looking at that, I, I know I trust my data because it's, it's been, uh, well, I guess I guess you only trust it. How well has it how how well has it done in the past? And I think then maybe that's how much you trust it. But also knowing that, you know, it's only data; it's not fact. We are launching a series this week in which we are running down Ohio State opponents week by week, starting with week one. And so I know everybody's gearing up for the Arkansas State preview next week. So, but. Please bear with us. We want to give every opponent his time. So while you're gearing up for Arkansas State and that huge conversation next week and Toledo the following week, we will suffer through the Notre Dame breakdown here with uh, – Well, Toledo uh, almost beat almost beat Notre Dame last year, Mark, so I understand. You right. Know. Absolutely. But uh, this guy is – one of the very best in the business. We got Brian Driscoll here from Irish Breakdown. And, uh, Brian, you know we appreciate uh, your time. So thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me on, Mark. Well, this one, um, so if we just take two of the best programs and teams in the country, put them together, everybody's geeked up and ready to see that game. But is there more to it than that? Is there more to it because of the, the proximity of the schools, more to it because of Marcus Freeman now being the head coach, Brian? Is there more to it because these are two of the very pillars of the sport? 
all those things uh, make it even better, bigger, more hyped than it would be otherwise. Oh, absolutely. I think the Marcus Freeman aspect is a part of it. You know, his basically de facto linebackers coach as a former All-American linebacker at Ohio State, James Laronitis, who's a GA at Notre Dame. But anyone that's been into practice knows that Al Golden's kind of being the D coordinator and James Laronitis is spending a lot of time with the linebackers. So there's obviously that aspect to it. There's a lot of Ohio guys on Notre Dame's coaching staff. Obviously, Al Washington's an Ohio guy. Mike Mickens is an Ohio guy. So I think those are aspects. And I think the fact, too, that these teams, as as with all their tradition that Notre Dame and Ohio State have, they've rarely ever played. I mean, in my lifetime, and I was born in 1978, they've played, I think, twice, right? Or three times, excuse me. Oh, no, in the regular season. I'm talking regular season. They've had a oh. couple bowl games. They had the 05 bowl game in the, in the Fiesta Bowl, and then obviously played it again in 2015. I'm talking like regular season. They just don't play that often. And when you think about the the location and all, you know, the fact that Notre Dame used to recruit Ohio a ton under the Lou Holtz era. And obviously, you know, for Jerry Faust, for all his issues, he recruited a lot of Ohio kids to Notre Dame in the, in the early 80s. So it's just one of those things is, you know, I'm a Northwest Ohio guy and growing up a Notre Dame fan. And you're like, why don't these two teams play? You know, I grew up in Lyme and it's like right in between the two of them. And it's like, why don't they play? It's just been the, it's been the aspect of it. So I think there's that. There's also that sort of that uniqueness. This isn't a matchup that we're going to see. Like if, if you know, Michigan and Notre Dame were playing in the opener and Michigan's coming off of a playoff appearance and Big Ten championship and all that, it's like, yeah, okay. But we've seen this before, right? We've seen this story before. This has so much more intrigue. And, and honestly, for Notre Dame, guys, it's big because before you get to beating, to passing Clemson and Georgia and Alabama, if you're trying to become the premier program, you got to first become the premier program in the Midwest. And right now, that's Ohio State. So beating them on the recruiting trail is part of it, but you got to prove you can beat them on the field. So, you know, if you're if you're talking about that matchup from a Notre Dame standpoint, you know, you, you've got to be able to do something against the Buckeyes because what they're 0-4 in my lifetime against Ohio State. So you've got to be able to prove you can beat them before you can start saying, hey, you know, Alabama, here we come. Like, oh, okay, cool. But you you, you got this team in Columbus, you got to be first. Yeah, I was a student at Ohio State in 94, 95, 96, and then 97, 98, 99, and 2000. Um, that, that's a joke. I was only there for four and a half years. But I, I remember the when that was announced, like Ohio State and Notre Dame were going to be playing it years in advance, obviously, and, and knowing that I was going to be a student there at, when that was going on, that, that was a huge deal to have Notre Dame come to Ohio Stadium, and it was, it was an amazing experience. And it, it, the years flew by as you're waiting for that, you know, like this is, this is going to happen. And when this was announced again, it's like, you, this is something you look forward to. I don't know that either team is looking forward to it being the season opener. I think both programs would prefer it to be, you know, game two, game three, something like that. And I'm, I'm just interested in, in, in your thoughts on this being a season opener, a, a career opener for Marcus Freeman. It, it's a tough way to open the season against Ohio state on the road and dealing with all of the expectations and uh, let alone scheming and, and dealing with Ohio State's offense and and all of that. Like, what, what are your thoughts on this being the opener for Notre Dame? I like it, to be honest with you. I feel like if Ohio State's your number two, then you're going to spend the whole – whole fall camp trying to pretend like you care about the, oh, we only care about the next team on our opponent. No, you don't care about New Mexico. You care about Ohio state. Right. I think there's that aspect to it. And I think there's the gamesmanship. Look, I'm, I'm a former coach and I think there's always some gamesmanship to it. Like, okay, you know, we've got a new defensive coordinator just like you do, but like we just spent the whole bowl prep prep session, breaking down that defensive coordinator's film where our defensive coordinator hasn't called a game since 2005, right? So, I mean, there's not a lot of film that, you know, going to go watch Bengal film, you know, from last year. I think there's that. And, you know, there's some a new starter quarterback. You know, you don't want to give him a ton of film of what a Tyler Buckner-led offense is going to look like. So there's that gamesmanship to it as well. But I honestly think sometimes having a game like that in game two or game three, if there's kind of cakewalk games, you know, let's say you were to put, you know, Toledo and – Who's what? Who, Arkansas State beforehand, you run the risk then of, are your guys really locked in for that game? You know, for Notre Dame, you know, they play Marshall and Cal. If you had Marshall and Cal before that, are they really locked in for Marshall and Cal? And, you know, then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you know, you're Notre Dame playing Toledo and you've got Purdue coming up and Wisconsin coming up and you don't take Toledo as serious as you need to. And then you're needing a four quarter drive to go down and beat them. Right. 
And and so I kind of like the idea of it from a Notre Dame standpoint. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a positive, you know, and it's and and also there's a the notion of, look, get that game out of the way, win or lose, <laughs> right? And then now you can focus on really building your team and getting ready for you know that October, November stretch, which is going to be pretty challenging for Notre Dame. Well, and for either team, win or lose, I don't this game isn't going to devastate either of them. Only because, if it's a blowout, I think. Right, right. I think that's and, the only way. Right. And you have the entire season to build back on it. And we see teams, you know, not everybody goes undefeated. And, right. and, yet, and there, there are plenty of one loss teams in the playoffs. So I, that's why I love these games because people, I, I can't stand the scheduling where you, you schedule yourself to go undefeated and, and you don't really like just, it's okay to have a loss. I mean, especially right. now with a 14 playoff, it's okay. And then you also grow from it. Uh, right. I do like the idea of just the mystery aspect yeah of Notre Dame because you get to see a little 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 a little bit of what to expect from the offense but um yeah you, you don't so really are, are you lot. saying you you wouldn't be excited about starting your season against Colorado State Hawaii and Yukon that no, doesn't excite I, you that's not a challenging schedule to get you no look I think it's great for the game those three Brian yeah mm. uh, I don't know some garbage team from up north that I think all of us that's the one thing we can unify around is that despising that program and its head coach and and all of its fan base, but I think it's good for your team too. I do. I think that when you have that challenge again, because to your to your point, I mean, Ohio State's won what one national title in the BC in the in the playoff era happened in a year where they lost by fourteen points mm-hmm. in the second or third game of the year at home to a team that went seven and six, right? But you learn lessons from that game, and then you go build. I mean, in twenty seventeen, Notre Dame lost to Georgia in the second game of the year. They that game was even though they lost. Notre Dame's players came out of the game like, look, we just went toe to toe with Georgia and we didn't play well. We should have, we should have beat them. And, and that kind of the confidence level that they came out of that game, it's like a week later, they went out and hung 500 plus rushing yards on Boston college. And then a week after that, they went out and beat a, a 10 win Michigan state team 38 to 18. And it wasn't that close of a game. And they just steamrolled everybody else. If they had to beat Georgia state that weekend, I don't know if Notre Dame comes out of that game with the same confidence. You look at Ohio state last year against Oregon. You had some warts exposed in that game. Well, if they don't get exposed until maybe later in the year in a game that matters a little bit more on the committee's standpoint, if you don't have that Oregon game. So, you know, I think games like that are are, are great. I wish we saw more of them. And props to Ohio State for not pulling an Alabama and saying we're going to have it on a neutral field, right? I mean, this is good for college football, and and it's it's good to see teams go on the road, play home and homes, and say, hey, we're going to challenge ourselves early it's going to be a test for us. We're going to find out where we're strong. We're going to find out some areas maybe we're not as strong. But I promise you this, by the time we go play Penn State, the time we go play Ohio, you know, Michigan, Ohio State's warts are going to be fixed. Notre Dame, by the time we get Clemson in November and by the time we go out to L.A. to play USC, we're going to have a lot of time to kind of fix these issues because we kind of saw who we were at the beginning because the goal for Ohio State's, I would believe, is still to compete for and win a championship, right? And that's what Notre Dame is trying to do. And you don't you don't evaluate yourself based on what you do against North Carolina or a depleted Stanford team or Indiana or Minnesota, teams like that. You do it by saying we're playing other similar caliber teams and, you know, we're going to learn about ourselves from that. That's going to help us get ready to be sure to, to be ready to do what we need to do in October, November. Has Tyler Buckner, Brian, shown you anything in limited time, but playing meaningful time against big opponents that either gives you concern that he's not ready for this or gives you optimism that he is ready for the shoe? Well, he's a playmaker. Uh, You know, I think when we saw him last year, you know, his first non sort of coming off the bench in a in a kind of rotation, just run the ball kind of role was against Virginia Tech last year. Right. And he comes out in the first first half. He plays just one quarter, goes five of eight for over 100 yards and turns a 10 nothing deficit into a 14-10 lead, right? That's the positive. Well, then Ohio, Virginia Tech goes in at halftime, makes adjustments. Tyler had been doing, you know, backup reps. It wasn't running the whole offense. They make some adjustments, and he struggles in the second half, right? So I think that game was one of those things where you say, you know, he handled that stadium, that crowd, and, and you know, you Ohio State's familiar with how loud that place can get if Virginia Tech's playing well. And he handled that environment well. It was more of a, okay, the rolled coverages, the the things that a young guy struggled with. So I think he showed the ability to kind of to handle the moment. I don't think that's going to be the question for him. And, and, of course, Lane Stadium is loud, but it's not 
the horseshoe, right? But it's at least an opportunity to do that. It's now about, okay, can you read the defense? Can you make plays? Can you do those type of things? And I think those are things that Kyle's going to have or Tyler's going to have to learn. But the good thing is, is, is when you have a young quarterback that can can make the dynamic plays that he can make with his legs, it eliminates some of that need to always be processing information. Because it's like if he's struggling, hey, just go call a couple runs and let him let him let him do something there to maybe slow down that pass rush or maybe to to mix up the coverages or whatever the case may be. And I think you know that's the that's something that I think Tommy Reese is going to have in his back pocket to say, look, if if we need to get him comfortable, we can always do a couple you know, read zones or some quick RPOs to let him get into the mix and get him into the flow. And hopefully you're able to run the football. I think that's going to be the big thing is, is Notre Dame's ability to get Tyler Buckner comfortable in that game is going to have a lot more to do with what you do with your big guys up front against an Ohio State. You know, Notre Dame didn't run the ball very well last year. Ohio State didn't stop the run very well last year. Well, they've both got new leadership, right? Notre Dame's got Harry Heastan now. Ohio State's got Jim Knowles. How will how will those teams two teams adapt? I think that's going to be the question. But Notre Dame's going to have to run the ball to take that pressure off Tyler Buckner. But the nice thing for him is he can be part of that running aspect. I think I was told by by someone at Notre Dame that they averaged like eight yards a carry last year on inside zone with Tyler Buckner in the game because you have to respect his ability to pull it and run it. And you know we'll see how how Ohio State's going to be able to to handle that, and we'll see if Notre Dame can block it up and get him free and design ways to get him in some matchups where he can take advantage of that athleticism. It will, it will be interesting to see how Ohio State handles that inside run with their 4-2-5 and do they have to adjust to a 4-3 or something like right. that to get more people in the mix there. And, and yeah, I'm just looking forward to just and, – and then what happens in the second half because right. yeah, the, the adjustments that both programs are going to be going through. Um, do you think that with Marcus Freeman – Obviously, a lot of programs wanted him. Notre Dame wanted to keep him, but is is was there? I'll ask this uh, gently. Was this a panic hire to yeah. keep him from leaving? Yeah, no, it wasn't. And and so what? What understand is Jack Swarbrick kind of he kind of viewed Marcus as the successor to Brian Kelly. I just don't think Jack Swarbrick knew it was going to be after a year. I, I, you know, I don't think anybody really knew Brian Kelly was going to leave that quickly, but we all knew Brian Kelly's time was coming to an end. And that's why Notre Dame, like, like Notre Dame did something with Marcus Freeman they've never done before. And that was, they got into a bidding war to get him. They didn't do that just to have him as his defensive coordinator. There's always an, an end game in mind. And, and look, Luke Fickle expressed interest in the job. Not, it never went to the point where would he take it or not? You know, there was other coaches that, uh, Mike Campbell had expressed interest in the job. There's a couple other coaches I, I I can't name that are big names that had expressed interest in the job, but it was just obvious to to Jack Swarbrick that this is just this is the guy. The players wanted him. The alumni loved him. He understands Notre Dame in a way that Brian Kelly never even tried to understand. And it's like, look, there's always a risk hiring a young coach, but I think there's enough evidence for Notre Dame in recent history, including Ohio State including Oklahoma, you know, Clemson with Dabo Sweeney. We've seen a lot of guys kind of get their start on that big stage. We can say, look, we've seen it. As long as you put a good enough staff around him, you know, he, he's got the chops, right? Because I think at the end of the day, guys, that's what I care about. I mean, we've seen veteran defensive coordinators, guys have been coaching a long time, come into a job and stink. We've seen young guys take over jobs and be good at it. If you got the chops, you got the chops. I've always believed that as a coach. But you think about who are the programs you're trying to be. You know, you're, you're trying to – have the success of getting multiple playoffs like Oklahoma had with a head coach that had never been, who was in his thirties and never been a head coach before Ohio state and the, the tremendous run they've been on since Ryan day got here, never been a head coach. I believe it was in his thirties when he got the job, right? That was Sweeney had never been, he'd never been a coordinator when he got the Clemson job. Right? So now the situations are different in every instance. Dabo was replacing a coach that had failed. Lincoln and Ryan Day were replacing coaches that have succeeded. That's more in line with what Marcus Freeman's going through. So it was not a panic hire. Now, it may not be the right hire. We'll find that out in time. But it wasn't a panic hire. There was enough coaches that had expressed interest in the job. And Notre Dame had expressed interest in saying, hey, look, we don't really care about the Fiesta Bowl. The job here is to get the right hire. If we've got to wait till after the playoff to hire Luke Fickle, Notre Dame was more than ready to do that. Because at the end of the day, you know, they, they were they were comfortable with that. It's just that after a second interview, it just was obvious that they felt Marcus Freeman was that guy. And, and so far, he's done a great job, right? I mean, you look at the staff he's put together. I mean, to me, that's the sign of are you a mature coach is do you surround yourself with other really good coaches? I understand my weakness as a head coach is inexperienced. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go hire Al Golden. 
who's in his 50s, to run my defense, who's been a head coach, who's been in the NFL. You bring back Harry Heastan, who's one of the best in the business at, it, at what he does. You bring in Jared Parker, who's got experience coaching the Big Ten. He was an interim head coach at Purdue, and he's somebody he trusts. Al Washington, someone who a year ago people were talking about, you know, maybe being a Tennessee defensive coordinator candidate. So he did a really tremendous job, in my opinion, of, of hiring a nice blend of young and older experienced coaches. So, so far, so good in regards to putting together his staff and building his team. Now we've got to see if he can motivate a team and get them in the right direction and go coach in game. That remains to be seen. But so far, I'm pleased with the job he's been able to do. Yeah, because the when, when it's the the players and the alumni that choose the coach, they, that there's all kinds yeah. of danger there. But I, I also see this more as the the Bob Stoops Bob Stoops handing it over to Lincoln Riley, yeah. Urban Meyer handing it over to Ryan Day. Like you, they just have more class than Brian when, Kelly. That's well, the difference. But like when you know, and, and Jack Swarbrick, like when you know, like I would be okay with this guy taking right. over. Because I I go back to uh, like I think 2016. I was at the Big Ten Media Days talking to Daryl Hazel. Marcus Freeman was the linebackers coach at Purdue at the time and said, you know, because I was asking him about Marcus Freeman, former Buckeye, let's talk about him. And he's like, this guy is a, a future star. He's like, he's he's a, he's going to be a star in business. He's going to be a head coach and it won't be too long. And then I was talking to a Juwan Bentley linebacker from Purdue, Purdue at the time. And everything he told me about Marcus Freeman is everything that Marcus Freeman and James Laurinaitis had told me about Luke Fickle. You know, like, they were the same person, the same kind of coach. And and Marcus Freeman has learned from Luke Fickle, learned from Jim Trestle, and, and and very different than Jim Trestle, very different than Brian Kelly in terms of care, I think, mm-hmm. in, 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 in that respect. And, different and Marcus many, Freeman's a polar opposite of Brian Kelly in that regard. Exactly. Well. And, and, and that's somebody that everybody can get behind. I think it's also something that recruits can get behind and I think that's where you've got an even more upside there. It's right. like, yes, we'll figure out how it goes on the field. But recruiting, it's hard to dislike Marcus Freeman. And right. it's not so hard to dislike Brian Kelly. No, it's actually harder to like him. I mean, and that was when he was winning. I mean, Mark knows this. Mark, you've known me for a couple of years now. Even when Notre Dame was winning games, I just, just you know, he just he wasn't – just because he's not a – it's not a good guy. And that's the thing. It's like, you know, look – is Ryan Day as good of a head coach as Urban Meyer? He hasn't proven that yet. He doesn't have three titles, but he's a lot more likable. You know, and it's just like, I can root for that guy. You know, uh, I know a lot of people hate on Dabo. I like Dabo. I, I, I like Dabo a whole lot more than I like Nick Saban. He's just a more likable guy. But, you know, likability and all that at the end of the day is not going to win you a championship. And, and, and recruiting only takes you so far, right? And, and, you know, for all the talent that Georgia's recruited and they've gotten to that state, if, if Alabama doesn't, isn't down their two best receivers by the, for, by halftime, they beat Georgia. I mean, as with, with 15 draftable players, right. And they'll get a little air quotes, a little tighter here. So y'all can see that, but I think you got to be able to coach and that's what Marcus Freeman's got to prove. I mean, the recruiting thing. Yes. I mean, look, Notre, Notre Dame's got the number one recruiting class in the country right now. It's not even close. You know, they have 12 kids committed and they're all 12, four or five stars on the, on the rivals rankings. I mean, I think nine of their kids are ranked as like top 250 kids and they're on the verge of, you know, potentially landing a few more big time players. So, you know, but now you got to go out and prove that you can coach because the 23 class may be great because they're riding that wave of momentum. But if you don't prove you can coach, the 24 class won't build on that. And that, at the end of the day, that's what he's got to do is it's not that one great class. It's stringing great classes and really good classes on top of each other. And that's that ultimately only happens if you're able to show you can win. I don't think there's any question that anyone that follows college football reasonably is impressed with Marcus Freeman, both from what he's produced on the field and then also just to hear him speak and, and uh, uh, people gravitate to him. Young men gravitate to, to his leadership. But I got to admit, Brian, that I, I am a bit uh, taken back at your level and other Notre Dame media level confidence that. Okay, taking Brian Kelly, and despite a few warts on his resume, it's still a tremendous trajectory that he took this program on, the best since Lou Holtz. The the just the unabashed elation over the hire of Marcus Freeman in replacing Brian Kelly. Well, look, I think he's gonna do a good job, but as I've said here, there's still he's got a lot, he's got to prove a lot, right? But he, here's the thing that drives me nuts about the the love for Brian Kelly. Number one is anyone that followed the program and is an objective and honest person, not afraid to speak the truth, is gonna tell you Brian Kelly wasn't even around half the time. 
I mean, I've heard this from former players, captains, guys in the NFL. He would meet us when we returned for January, and we wouldn't see him until spring ball started. And same thing would happen over the summer. They'd have to like have all their recruiting weekends in one weekend because Brian Kelly's on vacation this week and that weekend, right? He they won because and as far as they said, well, look at the hires he made. Jack Swarbrick and Chad Clunder are the ones that drove the hires for Mike Elko and Chip Long. And then Mike Elko is the one that pushed to bring in Clark Lee because Brian Kelly was trying to leave Notre Dame at the time because they'd just gone four and eight. He wanted out. It was it was Swarbrick. And then when no one would hire him because you just went four and eight against a terribly easy schedule where you lost a three and nine Michigan State, four and eight Duke, you know, and, and you go out there and, and you have that level of success. You say, well, he deserves all the credit. He was going to hire a strength coach from USC until Bob Diaco called him and said, you got to hire Matt Bayless. Like he was my guy at UConn. Look what he's done. We just got fired. You got to hire this guy. So it's like, well, what exactly should I give Brian Kelly credit for? And we say, well, Notre Dame went 32 and five the last three years. They went three and five against teams that finished in the year top 25. They went 11 and two this year. You know how many ranked teams they beat? Teams were ranked at the end of the year? Zero. They beat one ranked team in 2019. It was Navy. That's it, right? You don't get hired at Notre Dame to beat a bunch of nobodies. You get hired to beat the best teams in the country. Not only did they not beat the best teams in the country, they were usually not even competitive against the best teams in the country. And the only time they were was when Clemson didn't have Trevor Lawrence and their three best starters on defense. And they still need a double overtime to win that game, right? So that's why I have the disdain for Brian Kelly. He had no respect for Notre Dame and his traditions. He had he had he would constantly throw his players under the bus, right? Like it's his center's fault that he can't snap in a hurricane. Not my fault that I kept going shotgun and calling pass plays in the middle of a hurricane, right? It's 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 Deshaun Kaiser's fault or Justin Yoon's fault or my center's fault. He was like that his whole career. And, and it, it, he, he never gave credit to the people that deserved it, which was the coaches that were coaching their butts off and the players while he was out playing golf or shaking this person's hand or having this person tell him how wonderful he is. And that's why you saw such a universal acceptance of Marcus Freeman, because he's the anti Brian Kelly. He cares about the kids. He loves Notre Dame and embraces Notre Dame. He's one of the most genuine coaches you're going to meet. And I'm, I'm sure Tony will tell you, there's not a lot of genuine coaches in the, at this level. There's just not. You know, it's like Ohio State has one. You know, Tony Alford's one of my favorite coaches because love him or hate him, he is. that's who Tony is, right? He is a genuine guy, and that's why I have so much respect for him. And that's how Marcus Freeman is. And, and that's why you see alums. They had 300 alums come back for the spring game, right? Notre Dame alums aren't all hanging out in northern Indiana, right? They're across the country, sometimes the world because there's an excitement around Notre Dame because they actually feel like they have someone who gives a rip about them. I think that's why there's the acceptance is because it's not even just about can he win or not. It's just, yeah, but it's just like sometimes, you know, you're like you're winning, but there's just still this dark cloud around. You're not enjoying it. There's just this negativity. And, and you, it's like I said this when Jim Harbaugh was with the Niners. I said the first bad season he has, they're going to be out because you just – you better win because it's a miserable experience, and that's what Notre Dame went through. So maybe Marcus Freeman won't be able to coach. I don't know. But he's going to look out for his players. He's going to have their backs. He's going to love Notre Dame. And as we've seen, he's going to recruit his butt off. And you, as long as you have talent, you got a chance to win a you know beat a bunch of teams. There's no doubt about it. I also think he can be a lifer there. And it won't be looking for the next thing where, you know, Brian Kelly, you'd hear his name floated around every now and again. Uh, I am disappointed, though, with Marcus Freeman's turn to coaching because when he was playing and James Laurinaitis were playing, and his, obviously James Laurinaitis' father was a professional wrestler, one of the two uh, road warriors, they had talked about when their playing days were over, getting into wrestling and being a tag team. And I thought, you know, maybe those two guys could bring back the road warriors, yeah. the new generation of the road warriors. Now it, it's probably not going to happen, uh -huh. and it's a little bit disappointing. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I understand that. I mean, I, I'm a child of, I don't know how old you are, but I'm a, I'm in my mid forties. So I grew up in that era, right? Mm -hmm. Road Warriors versus Demolition. So yeah, mm -hmm. that would have been fun to see. That would have been fun to see. I'm actually, as a Notre Dame fan, I'm glad he didn't go down that route. <laughs> uh, both of them didn't go down that route. I think it's going to pay off well for Notre Dame, but yeah, I, I can, as an eight, as an eighties child of the, of the WWF, right? Yeah. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Please hit the like button, everyone. Uh, Treasure the Toro. We appreciate your contribution. We also have a super chat coming in from Cameron Gant. Cameron asking Brian, how confident is Notre Dame that Ohio State won't flip? So Keon Keeley, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, top 10 player in the nation, committed to Notre Dame, top uh, edge rusher, according to the uh, composite top three player in the state of Florida. Very 
Okay. It's not what I'm overly concerned about. I mean, I'm not saying Keon Key is going to sign with Notre Dame, but it, I don't. If he if he flips from Notre Dame, he's going to stay in the South. He's not going to go to Ohio State. All yeah, right. The, well, and the other aspect in that is Larry Johnson. Right now, anytime he's recruiting against schools, schools are telling those players, "Well, he's not going to be around for you for much longer. He's going to be retiring." So it's it, it's tough as well to to um, flip guys who are already committed in that restraint. Uh, Brian, the point spread is something like 10 and a half. I know you're not a point spread guy. Uh, Ohio State fans, as you may be noticing in the chat, are rather confident that this is just an Ohio State win. Uh, I'm guessing the Notre Dame fans are more like, we can compete, we can win this game. I I think it's going to be a heck of a game. What's your confidence level three months away, four months away? I'm not even there yet. I'm worried about getting to fall camp healthy. I mean, that's the coach in me, right? I'm not worried about that just yet. Look, here's the reality of it. If you want state fans, it's like Ohio State fans and Bama fans and Clemson fans, to just stop assuming you're going to get your butt kicked when you play them. Then stop getting your butt kicked when you go play them. It's as simple as that. So, you know, so are you upset that it's a 10.5 point spread? I'm like, have you seen what Notre Dame has done in the past against teams ranked in the top 10? It's not pretty. Ryan Kelly has a career three and 17 record against top 10 te- teams that finished in the top 10. And one of those wins was against a Michigan state team that at the time was unranked back in 2013. So no, I'm, I'm, I, I haven't thought a lot about the point spread, but you know, we've got to see a lot. We've got to see how Tyler Buckner develops in the spring. Can he stay healthy? And also his point spreads to me are, are a little, I mean, you know, like the, the Ohio state game in 2015, right. And, Notre Dame had it down to a seven point game in the third quarter. Like they just scored. It's kind of like, yeah, but it really wasn't that competitive of a game. You know, it's like I've had a friend that argued with me about this about the Michigan. Remember the, was it, was it four, 15 where Ohio State was like barely beating Michigan at halftime? And my buddy was like, this is a really close game. I'm like, are you watching the same game I'm watching? Because this is Ohio State's like fumbling around like they're going to blow Michigan out in the second half. And that's exactly what happened. So, uh, end of the day, you could be up, you could be up down four you're driving late in the game and you're trying to win it and you've got to go for a fourth down and they you know pick it off run it back you lost by 11 right i mean that's why i hate point spreads you just you just never know how a game is going to end so uh, right now if notre dame wants to not be 10 point underdogs to ohio state or not be an under a home underdog to clemson prove that you can win these games without needing their starting quarterback and three best defensive players to be out for the game i did like during the nfl draft the pregame show of the draft ESPN had Marcus Freeman and Ryan Day on the same set and made mention to Marcus Freeman of the line. And Ryan Day was like, we, we don't need to be talking about that. And Marcus right. Freeman is like, keep talking about it. Yeah, because it's motivation like, for the players, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's – but at the end of the day, motivation only takes you so far. Once the ball snapped, motiv- you know, you're not, you're not winning a game because you were an underdog. You're winning that game because you prepared and you executed at a high level. And, and that at the end of the day. But, yes – I'm not going to lie and say that I wouldn't like the spread to get even more because I think for Notre Dame, it gives you that disrespect card, you know, and I, sometimes if, if you're really coached well and you have good leadership, you don't lose that. Even if you go out and beat Ohio state or, or maybe it's a, you know, it's a, it's a like the Georgia game in 2019 and the Georgia game in 2017, 2017 and 19, Notre Dame had the ball in the fourth quarter, a chance to win both games. You fell short and say, you know, Hey, you know what? Let's improve. Let's make some corrections because we almost beat that team. And, you know, next time we're going to get our shot. But um, I, I hope it's a bigger game. But, you know, we'll have to we'll have to see yeah, bigger I, I and faster. Think, I don't know about the bigger part, maybe the faster part. But yeah, the, the line, I don't think it will, does much. You know, it, it'll do a little bit of motivation. The most motivation that I've ever seen on this beat and, and watching is after Ohio State lost to Clemson in the playoffs the first time. They were motivated all year long, and then they got to play them again in 2020, and you saw it happen. And, and that was their motivation. And well, they had a that was game a big, in between that. Well, I mean, it, it, from 2019, what? they had an entire season, but they were motivated right. motivated by that loss, that playoff loss to to uh, to Clemson in 20. About the one in 16 or the one in 19. 19. Okay, gotcha. And and gotcha. then. They beat them in 2020 in the playoffs to go to the championship game. Well, Clemson too. had that in 2015. You know, mm-hmm. they had that close loss to Bam and like, hey, you know what? Like, we can play with these guys. And then it did serve as motivation. But at the end of the day, do you have a good game plan? Right. Can you execute that game plan? And do you have enough talent to to out outplay that team? I mean, Utah, to me, I thought outplayed Ohio State for most of that game, but they still lost because Ohio State had way better players. 
You know, I mean, that that at the end of the day, motivation only takes I, as a coach. Look, I've been there. I've, we've done the whole play the disrespect card. But once the ball snapped, you get in the mouth. Nobody's thinking about what the point spread is. That That's the reality of it. Right. For either team. Ohio State fans only have to go back uh, five or six months to the Oregon game and remember what that point spread was. What, 14 and a half, Tony? Yeah, something like that. that. It was too high, it turns out. <laughs> yeah, well, and we've seen that from Ohio State in September's before. I mean, that's the thing is why I think point, point spreads early in the seasons are, are kind of nonsense. I mean, what was this point spread for Notre Dame going into Toledo game last year, right? Like, you really don't know what either one of these teams are going to be. And that's that's why – that's why I don't bet, but it's definitely why I would never bet on openers or, you know, games in the first month of the season because you don't know what these teams are going to be. Especially when you're just trying to get out with a one-point win any way you can. That's, That's all you That's care it. about. That's it. That's it. No, and I'll say this. I mean, Ohio State may be faster than than uh, than uh, Notre Dame, but uh, they're definitely not bigger than Notre Dame, especially when you look at the offensive Notre Dame offensive line against the, against the Michigan defense or the Ohio State defensive line. Well, especially if Ohio State is playing a four-two-five, they've they've right. shrunk themselves by right. by the process of it. Right. Yes, it will be something to behold. And uh, back to the betting portion of this, it's one of the reasons why I tell people that actually the prediction record against the money line, just saying who's going to win and who's is actually a more valid prediction. Obviously, it's going to be a higher percentage, but it's actually a more valid prediction than. Picking against the spread. Nobody quite understands my point there, but uh, it's the point oh, that man. Brian was making about me, having a beat on the game and right. thinking, okay, this thing's playing out exactly the way I thought. And then suddenly there's a, a scoop and score with 32 seconds left that doesn't have anything or the to other do way with the outcome of the game. What if one? What if Ohio State's up by 17 and they're thoroughly out playing Notre Dame and Notre Dame gets a garbage touchdown sure. at the end to make it a 10 point win? Okay, we didn't cover. Right. You lost, even though, you know, the game kind of played out like that type of line would otherwise determine. Yep. So it's just one of a million reasons that and I'm really cheap and tight. So that's just <laughs> one of the many reasons I don't I don't bet. That's, that's a wise move on your part. That's a wise move on your part. Brian Driscoll, Irish Breakdown. It is an amazing uh, platform that they have there. So please check it out with Brian, whether you're a Notre Dame fan. If you're a Notre Dame fan, I can't imagine. And Brian, I was going to say your your name and uh, information there looks really good in Scarlet. If you didn't notice. Yeah, I, I want to barf, but I'll wait till after I get off the show. Okay. You got to understand, please, please I, I grew up in Northwest Ohio. I'm surrounded by Ohio State fans. I've been seeing this stinking Scarlet my whole life, but uh, you know, I'm used to it by now. Then – it begs the question, where did it all go wrong? Well, I mean, I think it all went right because I was also a Denver Bronco fan growing up in Northwest Ohio, you oh. know, and so I had to deal with all that nonsense about we're going to beat you in the AFC championship, and that never happened. So uh, I'll, I'll take all the I'll take all those, you know, all those okay. dubs and those. But no, I my dad was a Notre Dame fan. He grew up in Norfolk, Virginia, and was listening to the Lindsey Nelson replays on Sundays, and he just – you know, there wasn't any college football in, the, in you know, the mid-Atlantic area in the, the 70s, 60s, and 70s. And that just kind of became my fan and or my my team as well because my dad, you got to remember, when I was 10 years old and kind of in my formative years, I was 88, 89, 90. Like, Notre Dame was the modern-day, you know, Clemson sure. or Alabama back then, you know. And that was so I was like, man, this is going to be fun. <laughs> Little did I know <laughs> what was coming afterwards. But, yeah, I've just been been – well, to Tony's place. point, and I'm a few years older than Tony, when that uh, Ohio State-Notre Dame series of 95-96 was announced, it was like 1988-89, yeah. and I remember being surrounded by a few Notre Dame fans who were like, we're going to kick your ass, and I was like, yeah, yeah this may be ugly, Do because you, at that point... Right. It's like, like <laughs> it was the, the Bama, Notre Dame plays Bama in 28-29, like, oh, you're going to get killed. I'm like, Do we really have any clue what either one of these teams are going to look like <laughs> in 28 or 29? You know, like I have no idea, but yeah, it, I wish that I wish those games would have been like because those, especially the team with Eddie George, like if it, I would have loved seeing that Ohio State team against one of the vintage Notre Dame teams of '88 to '93, that'd have been such a great game. And at the end of the day, Mark, you know my stance on this. I'm a Notre Dame fan. I don't apologize for that, but I also love college football, and I think games like this are great for college football. I think we need to see more of this. We need to see more of Oklahoma playing Ohio State and Notre Dame playing Clemson and home and homes and you know, games like that. I'm so tired of the, you know, that's why I get respect for Georgia, right? I, 
I got a ton of respect for Georgia and Auburn. I have none for Bama because Georgia will go to South Bend and play Notre Dame, right? Nick Saban doesn't schedule that game until basically he's going to be 80 and retired, yep. right? Like, you know, I just – that's what college football should be about. And, and to Tony's earlier point, I think it's good for teams to have that. You know, get that early season game because if Notre Dame loses to Ohio State or Ohio State loses to Notre Dame and they run the, t- the loser runs the table the rest of the way, they're probably still a playoff team as long as it wasn't like a 30 point loss. Right. And and so, I mean, if Ohio State can sustain a 14 point loss to Virginia Tech, who went seven and six and still make the playoff, then, you know, but I think it makes you a better team. But more importantly, it's great for the game. It's great for fans. It's great for the kids. Be able to have that kind of experience. Hey, I, I played against Ohio State or I played against Notre Dame. And, and that's why I love games like this. And I wish we would see more of it, to be honest with you. We have an unbiased uh, perspective here, the voice of college football. So we will allow Dave to get his, uh, his comment in here. He's cheering for the comment, Michigan fan. <laughs> Understandable. Well, all right. The, the thing he fails to realize is Ohio is not that, that far from Michigan. So if a comment hits Ohio, it is going to impact Michigan right. in some form. Or it's a, dude, it's a Michigan fan. Do you really expect that level of I'm just I'm joking, kind of. And also your Yankees, if you're a Michigan fan, the Yankees are going to be destroyed, the Cowboys are going to be destroyed. Sure. <laughs> teams that win, teams. you know. There you go. Brian Driscoll, Irish Breakdown. You got to catch him right there. Brian, uh let everyone know where they can find you, both you and your podcast and um site. Well, obviously, our website is irishbreakdown.com. We also have a premium message board you can join. You can find that at irishbreakdown.com. If you go to YouTube, our Irish Breakdown slash Notre Dame football channel, and obviously, you can look at any everywhere you can find a podcast, you will find the Irish Breakdown podcast. So give us a subscribe, and uh, if you're listening to our podcast anytime, give us a five-star review. We greatly appreciate that. But we also welcome other fans. We have a USC fan that comes in our chat all the time. We have a Bama fan that comes in our chat all the time. As long as you come and you're willing to talk ball and not just be a a, you know, a, a, an idiot like LSU and Michigan fan. We, we actually have a good Michigan fan lately, but LSU fans have no ability to act with any sense whatsoever. So we boot all them. But if you want to come talk ball, we'd love it. We'll embrace it. We'll welcome you. And, and uh, you know, sometimes we'll be having a show and there's like this whole different chat going on with our resident Bama fan and Notre Dame fans. And it's their talking ball. It's respectful. And so I think most fan bases, at least Notre Dame fans, they love Notre Dame, but they love college football and they love talking college football. And uh, that's what we try to make our channel be about. Tony. Well, I, I would also say as a fellow Northwest Ohio child, Notre Dame was my number two team. I, you know, used to tape tape the games on the VCR. The uh, what was it? The Michigan game where uh, Rocket had two punt 89. touchdowns. Eighty nine. That, that Ocean Becker. We've ne- We're gonna. We're not afraid to kick to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well. Maybe you should have been. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right. Uh, you know, Tony Rice. All those guys. All of those great running backs at Notre Dame and grew up watching them and, and enjoying them until I got to high school. And then the Notre Dame fans were just insufferable. So if you're from Northwest Ohio, it's Ohio state, it's Notre Dame, it's Michigan. It's one of those three. And that's about it. But uh, yeah, you can find me at the on Twitter at Tony Gerdeman. And of course the, uh, the podcast is the Buckeye weekly podcast on all of your platforms. And we can all agree on whatever show is up next here at the voice of college football and speaking of which hey wolverines live at five eastern yes be here for that guys it was a great conversation appreciate both of you thanks for being here and uh, it should be something else and brian would love to have you back to talk uh, notre dame again as always thanks tony appreciate you guys all right we'll see everybody back here next wednesday